<laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> now, here we are, here we are. Ah, uh, old monks. Well, I translate it as Magnificat, Anima Mea Dominus. So, I glorify you. Magnificat, I think he glorifies you, isn't it? Used to do anyway, whatever. Third ten, uh, yeah. mm. Anyway, <coughs> rusty Latin. <coughs> but anima mea, <laughs> dominus. <laughs> anima, is it meum, dominus? Give my spirit some wolf, O oh Lord. It's <laughs> <coughs> my somewhat loose translation. Well, now, the agony and the ecstasy. So, well, there's a very well-known book and a film. That I've read the book in particular uh, by a chap called Irving Stone um, about the life of Michelangelo, Michelangelo Buonarroti, who, of course, amongst many other things, but he's uh, very well known, of course, for the David, the naked statue of David, which I think is originally it was a 17 foot block of Carrera marble, which apparently is the finest marble for sculpting, and no one else could touch it, and so on and so on. I was actually in Cape Town when I read it. <laughs> as it happens, as one does, I think I was 19, staying with my mother's sister in Cape Town. I'm a white African born in Cape Town, but my mother brought us out of South Africa. My father's side were English and Scottish ancestors and so on. Anyway, um, so sort of 30 years London, actually. But anyway, and I read it through the night, got to the airport at Cape Town. Uh, and lo and behold, I'd left everything, my passport, money, everything, all that stuff, behind in a little bag. <laughs> and I had no money, and would anyone give me the tuppence to make a telephone call? I think, obviously, someone did in the end. And I called the flight. But I was so engrossed, I just read it through the night. <laughs> so, the agony and the ecstasy, well... Clearly, he felt that was an appropriate title for Michelangelo. I think it might well apply to many artistic people. Mozart comes to mind. I think he was had enormous sort of just inspirational stuff going on inside. I think creative people often are uh, do have these sort of the two sides of life. Now, I am a Christian, and listening, uh, today is Monday, the 15th of August, 2022, I'm in Alec, Northumbria, England. Uh, there's this very well-known television personality does something called QI, he's the chairman of that, and he's rather good. Bertie Worcester and Jeeves films as well, uh, when they were younger. But what an awful little man, denies God altogether, is arguing this, that, and the other way, that God doesn't exist. And in particular, because of the suffering in the world. Well, do you think I'm not aware of the suffering? What? So I just deny God then. Particularly instancing, there's a little wormy thing that burrows its way in. For some reason, it, it 
goes into one's eye and gives you blind, makes you blind, whatever that little beastie is, and he's saying, well, how can a loving God allow that? Well, if I'd been there talking with him, it came to me later, there's something called fire, you see, which provides heat, light, etc. Well, beautiful, wonderful stuff, fire. But you don't go and put your hand in it, do you? Because you get burnt. Well, I think the same could apply to, to disease. We live in a world, well, I mean, you know, what's, I, mean, I was up this morning early at 1 a.m., midnight actually, through till about 5 today, being sort of creative, but, and I stood on a slug, yeah, slug. A beautiful sort of moonlit, the moon, full moon's just going over, um, and now it's gone misty. Well, and cooler up here, still pretty hot down south, 30 down south, but only sort of 20 here, which is really quite pleasant. So, I mean, that's just one way of, of, of absolutely... Yes, there's suffering in the world. Yes, I have physically actually carried a small human being, a tiny little thing, but it was two-year-old, black little baby in my arms, and it just had no language. Ma, just went, ma. We christened it Luke. There were no birth papers. Mother obviously wanted to get rid of it. And it's at a crossroads on big uh, main roads in South Africa, and obviously the lorry drivers have money, and the girls don't, and etc. And it had been hidden away, and someone must have fed it. And you know, I cry. But do you think God doesn't know all this? The suffering, you know. There's the obvious holocaust for the Jews, but I mean, I understand something like 20 million Russians died. 1932, there was this huge famine in what's now Ukraine, etc. Just anywhere you can look. Sri Lanka, Yemen, it's going on now. Syria. Anywhere, Brazil. All over the world. China, obviously. The Uyghur. And range of Muslims, that's me and Narbonne, and so on. Everywhere, yes. So, because there's suffering, you deny God. That's the, 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 the logic of Mr. Stephen Fry. Well, rubbish to you, sunshine. Where does that leave us? I most certainly do argue the case for, as my mother would say, philosophers envy those who suffer. If you just sail through life, no troubles at all, you haven't lived. You don't know about life, what it really means. I, you haven't experienced the low to give you the contrast of the high and understand that better if you just sail along on a, on a sort of even keel throughout your life, well, okay, very nice, and no one would wish suffering on someone else, and certainly I'm not suggesting that I would wish to make someone suffer, but if God does it, God is the Alpha and the Omega, just been talking about this, before the Big Bang there was God, after the whole universe collapses down into nothing, there will be God, so there, so puff to Mr. Stephen Fry and his atheist. I think he's pretty much an atheist. He's not an agnostic. He's definitively saying there is no God. What a hurry, little man. Puff to him. There is this agony and ecstasy in life to greater or lesser extents. So I found myself looking up Jacqueline Dupre, who of course was a wonderful cellist. Uh, she started getting um, multiple sclerosis at only 28 years old and going downhill and died at only the age of 42. Well, 
I mean, it's just such an obvious question to ask. Why? How does a loving God do that? His purposes are just beyond us, all right? That's it. It's our duty as human beings to love him and to trust him. Amen. Whatever comes, if you're actually, and I will say this, given the gift of suffering as an adult, it is God's loving way of teaching you things you would never otherwise know about yourself, about the world, the nature of the world, the people in it, and so on. Amen. Go back to the old monks. <laughs> Let them out of their box. Well, I mean, my material circumstances at present are fine. I get dressed this way. <laughs> I work all night and I find myself looking up trains to <laughs> go off on the trips. <laughs> what good will that do? Oh, Lord. Well, this is not our final resting place, that's for definite sure. Okay, there is more. And it's a question of thy will be done, not my will. And I lived out, I lived out for so on and off for, my money ran out in 2009. And I've only been in sort of more or less properly for the last Maybe three years now, actually, so whatever that equals. Ten years, I don't know if I was living out with no money, etc. Well, actually, I rather enjoyed it <laughs> at times. Sure, it had its downside. You'd get killed, for instance. I knew of a chap who, some idiot just set fire to him. Someone actually tried to set fire to me at the railway station in Amiens in France. So, it's thy will be done. Put your hand in the hand of the man who steals the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Not your hand in the hand of the man, 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 of the man. Put your hand in the hand of the man who steals the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man from God.